Good evening, everybody, except it's not. It's 1.30 p.m. My name is Sean Benson, and I'm one of your hosts of Punch, Kick, Choke Chat. We have a special guest today who couldn't uh, do the nighttime show, and we're always happy to accommodate when we have someone of her caliber and stature. I'm here today with Sensei Renshi Lori O'Connell. And uh, as you know, we like to jump right in with the question. Now, um, Sensei O'Connell, you spent years training in Japan, and we're going to open this up with as much a statement as a question. I won't say who, I won't say when, but some of the members on this call once said in a private car drive, the best martial arts in the world are happening in North America right now. So I want to ask you what you think of that, having trained extensively over there and obviously making your home over here. And we're going to go around the horn on this. So Sensei, get your, get your provocative comments ready. What do you think, Sensei? Uh, well, I think extensive is not the best word to say what I did in Japan. I went there with the idea that I was going to train extensively. Uh, I did train in some Aikido at a local school where I was working. And honestly, I was not impressed with what I was receiving in terms of attention in that school. Uh, I was being treated like a gaijin and they put me with children every time. Children that they drugged to, had literally dragged to me screaming they didn't want to work with the gaijin mm. and forced them to work with me um i put up with it for like eight months after a while i was just like you know what i don't even know why i'm bothering with this <laughs> um and i had a number of uh foreigner friends who wanted to train in what i was uh ranked in so i started teaching my own class at the local community center where i was working and that's where the school that I was training in Aikido was. Funny thing was, after I started doing what I was doing, they started kind of seeing what I was doing. And then they started off, you know, like, oh, you know, I have some really good books you might find interesting. And that, that all of a sudden, there was some more interest in me. But I'm like, too late. Uh, like, you guys treated me as like garbage. And I didn't want to, like, you know, like, it's too late. <laughs> so... Um, I did not train extensively in Japan. I just right. trained in Japan. Uh, I did end up training in Tai Chi there, though, for a little while as well, which is not even a Japanese art I recognize. But uh, they were much friendlier to me, so I enjoyed that a lot more. I was training with a, basically a group of old ladies. But it was fun, and, you know, I got to do something. And I still taught the old, entire time I was there before I moved to Vancouver. Um. Right on. So actually, let me crack that into one more question, and then we'll add this to the round the horn with the other senseis. Um, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, pre-internet, and if we go especially 50, 60, like before martial arts had come over with the servicemen generally, um, you kind of would have to eat shit to learn from a teacher. But in this day and age, when there's a lot of great teachers, you know, I wrote down the words put up with. The idea that why would you put up with that? So do you think in 2024, there's any value to putting up with someone who's not willing to teach you for that old school Zen kneeling outside the Shaolin temple idea? Um, I have not seen a, a situation where I would think it's appropriate to put up with it. I'm not right. saying it's impossible, but the cases where I've seen it, it was not worth it. Right on. Um, I won't bore you with our chat, but Sensei Dolphin and I were chatting this morning, and I was chatting about my difficulty sometimes moving on when I'm rejected, because I try and earn back good favor. And when you just said, too late, I thought that was really impressive, because I could use a bit more of that in my life. Sensei Suino, let's go to you with this question. Uh, is the best martial arts in the world over here or there these days? And is there any value these days to putting up with that teacher they might be good, but there might be another one not far away who's willing to offer you a cleaner path. Yeah. My answer to the first part of that question is, I don't think you can say the best martial arts are somewhere. Uh, there are incredible martial arts and incredible martial arts teachers more widely around the world than there used to be. But I can still take you to some of the best martial artists in the world in Japan um, and probably in Canada and in the US and those are the countries I know about personally. So um, I think it has a lot more to do with, uh, with the association, the dojo, the person than it does, than it does with the, with the nation. 
and part of that is probably what you said, you know, that there's there's a vast internet and information supply, but also that the martial arts have been disseminated outside of Asia now since since World War II robustly. And that might be why that's true. As far as um, having to go through a hazing process, I went through them when I moved <laughs> to Japan. Um, I like that term. Not quite the same as as uh, Ranchi O'Connell's experience. Um, I did have a letter of introduction to my first Japanese teacher, and I had to I had to um, storm the walls repeatedly with him over a period of months before he would give me the introduction to the next teacher I wanted. So they weren't treating me badly. They were just very conservative. And um, uh, especially my Iaido teacher uh, was the best at what he did then and probably one of the best people that ever lived in that art. I would have put up with a lot more shit right. in that case, right? So I think it, it depends on what's on the other side of the castle walls. Thanks. Hanchi Legacy, where do you go with this? Do, do you think you could say the best martial arts is there or here? And do you think in 2024, it's worth kneeling outside the temple for a month and freezing? Or do you walk down to a temple that's maybe decent down the road? Well, I'm not saying it's not, because it could very well be. I'm just saying uh, that other countries, mainly in this continent, the United States and Canada, have somewhat caught up. Uh, and I'm just going to draw a bit of a... It's like hockey in the world now. While hockey may still be the best in Canada, that sometimes it may not. So I just think that uh, the world is getting smaller. We have more of an opportunity to reach uh, Japan initially uh, to ourselves become... Uh, become as good as or as training as hard as anyone in the world. But who knows, like uh, Sensei Suino said, who said where, who knows where the best schools are? And again, I'm sure there are great schools in Japan, but I learned all my stuff, which was learned in Okinawa, with my son, who is an American GI. Marine, I may get, I may get heck for that. <laughs> so I think that's going to be the general consensus here that anywhere in the world is opposed to only the Orient now. And then what about the reluctant teacher who doesn't want to teach? Do you, do you wait for that teacher at a time when there are other good teachers around when maybe there weren't 50 years ago? Are you asking me that? I am. Yes, Hanchi. Well, you know, the reluctant teachers, we don't know about them, so we have to go with what we have. Uh, I myself went to Okinawa. Uh, I know Ikihara Sensei and know Taba Sensei, who is now passed. Uh, we trained with a few of those persons. Um, I imagine they were as good as anybody. But again, when you say as good as anybody, they are also persons that were here that uh, are good martial arts teachers as well. And, Thanks, and Anthony Sandoval, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, Sensei Dolphin, where do you want to go with these two ideas? Uh, I'll answer the first one, or the second one first, which is, do you wait for a good teacher? If you know they're a good teacher, then you 100% wait. Like, if you know that that's they have the knowledge and they have the ability to teach you and um, then, okay. If you don't know, then you don't wait because right. time is a real thing and you just don't wait around for something you don't know. You move on to the thing that you do, I, I think. Right. But if you know, they're a good teacher, then um, you should be patient and wait. <clears throat> In this instance, we're talking about, uh, you know, when Sets Suino went, he was there for years. Uh, Renchi O'Connell was there for, you know, she said not extensive training and I was there for even less extensive training. So I just, uh, to, to Sets Legacy's point, I feel I was pretty good at karate before I went to Japan. I feel like I was pretty good at Iaido before I went. When I got there, I met some really amazing teachers and I know they helped me get a little bit better. Um, and when I left, I continued my training in North America, not really thinking, oh, I need to get back to Japan, like to make my training better. Um, I will say I love Japan. 
Uh, I love going to Japan. I love going to Okinawa. I like to train there. I like the food there. I like the people there. I like being a visible minority with tattoos that people get away from there, that they try and move away from me or they kick me out of swimming pools there. Um, uh, but yeah, I guess I don't know if I answered your question completely, uh, but that's what I, those are the thoughts that are running around. Right on. Well, I'll throw it back to you, Sensei O'Connell, before we do our more formal introductions. But I do like the idea that, for example, that mirrors what her experience was, if I'm not wrong, Sensei O'Connell, that she went and then eventually they're like, wait, you're doing a good thing over here. We're going to now latch on to you. So obviously what she went with, unless I'm wrong, Sensei O'Connell, was was quite worthy over there. Uh, honestly, I never really got their opinion or why they changed their mind, but they saw that I was committed to whatever it was that I was doing. And I guess they didn't think what I was doing looked terrible. Otherwise mm. they wouldn't have taken an interest. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts. Like I said, we're here and Sensei Dolphin is going to do a more formal and proper introduction of Renchi Laurie O'Connell. And I just want to say that I'm here with Sensei Randy Dolphin, Sensei Nicholas Suino, Anchi Gary Legacy. And very simply, my intro for them is we've all trained, sweat and bled on Japanese and Okinawan soil. And, uh, whether we think martial arts are better here or there or not is, I think, maybe a little bit irrelevant. It's a fun thing to chat about. But the fact that we train here, we train there, we train everywhere is something I'm proud to say I do with my teachers. And I'll throw it to you, Sensei Dofa. Thanks so much, uh, Reggie O'Connell. Thanks. Also, I want to thank you for having such a well laid out website because it made it very easy for me <laughs> to do my, my research and get, gather information on you. So um, Renchi O'Connell, she really breaks down uh, her areas of expertise into four areas, which is acting and stunt work, um, writing, entrepreneurship, and obviously martial arts, right? So acting and stunt work, she's a highly experienced stunt performer um, who obviously uses her martial arts. But in addition to that, uh, she's done a wide variety of uh, water, wire, and even fire stunts. And if you go on her website, you'll see some the... Your promo video is outstanding. I love it. Um, in the past few years, uh, Renchi O'Connell has branched out into stunt coordinating as well, uh, which I think is great. And if you you check it out, I don't know all of these, but a very impressive list. And I know there's more than these. So she's she's done stunt work and performed on uh, TV and movie shows like Siren, The Haunting of a Bly Manor, Umbrella Academy, Gen V, Joyride, Avatar, The Last Airbender. I think since the screen, I saw his eyes go up. I know he maybe he saw some of your stunts in that. <laughs> uh, also, Once Upon a Dime, The Predator. Like you're getting the, the picture, right? When it comes to stunt work, she does a lot of it. She's been on a lot of things. I'm surprised that you and Sean haven't um, bumped into each other already. Well, I got um, a question for her after on that, but we'll get to it. <laughs> although I don't think she's going to be doing stunts for you, Sean. Sorry, they're going to find... Um, uh, a, little... a, a much different looking person <laughs> for you um <laughs> but also uh Renchi o'connell is also an actor um and she's done acting as well uh she's re represented by uh, brenda wong at mvm agency and some of the roles that she's done include uh pretty hard cases uh balestra uh a davis uh, christmas carol apophrity um, and moving into an entrepreneur role, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, she's been starting and running small businesses for a very long time. Uh, she started out, since the Suino, you'll like this, running a co-writing business, which eventually included web marketing. And if you don't know that, Renchi O'Connell, since the Suino runs the exact same business as that right now. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he's sitting in the office at uh, SEO um, Ann Arbor. Uh Obviously, uh, Renchi O'Connell has run martial arts uh, dojos. Uh, during the pandemic, she decided to use her time to take a six-month life coaching course at the Canadian Coaching Academy, and she still continues to do that and has clients. Um, she's most re recently partnered with, uh, with her partner, Chris, um, moved back to Ontario into the Ottawa area. Um, she's building a new home on a forested riverfront property, but the cool thing is she's going to run an Airbnb business. It's going to be called Leaf on the Winds Nature Retreat. Uh, she's going to be opening a new dojo there, uh, the New Leaf Dojo. 
um, and has plans to tra transform uh, her life um, coaching practice there. And it's going to be called Wilder Side Coaching. Martial artist Renshi O'Connell has trained in the martial arts for over 30 years, so not a quitter, and taught for over 27 years. Um, she's owned and been the head instructor of Pacific Wave Jiu-Jitsu in Richmond, B.C. Um, we have a dojo there too, uh, uh, Renshi, we have uh, in, in Richmond. Um, she holds the rank of fifth degree black belt and holds the title of Renshi and can Ryu Jiu Jitsu. And even though she said for us to call her Lori, we're probably going to just continually call her Renshi or Sensei. Um, uh, but in addition to that, and through her, her uh, stunt work, she's supplemented, and I really like this, her primary style um, by studying a wide variety of other martial arts, ones that we all know, Filipino martial arts, boxing and kickboxing, um, BJJ, MMA, Kung Fu, Tai Chi, Karate, Aikido. So just very well, well breadth in martial arts. Um, in writing, uh, Sensei O'Connell is uh, the author of two books, When Fighting Goes to the Ground, uh, Jiu-Jitsu Strategies and Tactics for Self-Defense, and also Weapons of Opportunity. Um, you can check out her blog. I was, I was cruising through it. There's lots of great things on there. Um, She's written regularly on other people's blogs. She's been on lots of podcasts, none quite as good as Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat, but um, but she's been on other podcasts. And yeah, and so for me, I just want to say, um, like I said, her website is really good and I encourage you to go check it out. Um, it's laurieoconnell.com, www.laurieoconnell.com. Go check it out. Um, you One thing I that really kind of spoke to me when I was looking at all the things you do, Renshi O'Connell, is, and what I really liked is um, martial arts is at the center of all of it, whether it's the writing or the stunt work or the, and it's so cool to see somebody who takes that passion and then can find ways to like branch out with it and expand it and make it more inclusive for everybody. And so thanks so much for coming on and uh, really looking forward to chatting with you. Well, thank so, you for having me. Happy to be here. <laughs> it's our pleasure. And for everybody watching, Robert just lit up the button at the bottom. So if you're here on Zoom live with us, you're part of our living history, and you can ask your questions for Sensei O'Connell there. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube asynchronously or a podcast, we're glad you're here. Please subscribe and like. Before I ask you our general first question, uh, Sensei O'Connell, do you know Lisa Chandler? I see you guys follow each other on Instagram. Yes, I do. I did a lot of work with her on Siren, actually. Oh, my God. I love that. I don't know if you can see that. That's me and her out in Calgary. Oh, that's we wild. Just, <laughs> yeah, shooting Billy the Kid. Um, we didn't always get along on the show, but we spent a lot of time out at the gun range and hanging out. We, uh, I adore Lisa. So anyways, um, we do have a, a one step in common removed. Um, but back to you. What was it like growing up for you? And what led you into your first martial arts club? Uh, growing up, well, um, in my really young years in elementary school, I was bullied quite a lot. Um, and that was kind of the impetus for me to end up taking the martial arts. Actually, the first martial art I took was fencing, um, which you know, questionable with calling it martial art, more of a sport, in my opinion. But uh, it got me interested in fighting arts. Um, and I did that for a few years. And I think I peaked at 26th in Canada in women's foil, uh, after which I decided I wanted to try something different. And I took jujitsu because it seemed like a very practical um, form of self-defense training, which was my primary motivation to take it. Um, well, let's talk about that because you, you, you started in Japanese jujitsu, yes? Yes. Kanryu jujitsu is a, a style of Japanese jujitsu that's Kanryu meaning Canadian style of jujitsu, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we've had some some guests on who have that lineage as well. And so my question for you, you know, um, that is not when we think about today, everybody thinks BJJ is the one that's practical and Japanese Jiu Jitsu is the one that's a little more formal. Um, what do you think about that? There's more than one form of Japanese Jiu Jitsu. I mean, I would call it more of a modern traditional style of Japanese Jiu Jitsu because it's it's not adhering to rigor you know, like solidly Japanese roots it was modified in order to make it appropriate for use in self-defense in Canada specifically for the unique temperaments of the Canadian culture and our laws as well ah. um, 
So, I mean, if you're making it with the purpose of it being applied in that context, it just, you'd think that would make it a little bit more relevant to that context. Um, absolutely. So, so talk to us about your instructors and people you might've met at the club and just that, that beginning period and what led you to go, oh yeah, this is me now, I'm doing this. Actually, it was a friend of mine who was training with Hisco Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, he told me about it and, and, you know, and how practical it was. He showed me a few things and it seemed like a cool thing to do. So I went and did the trial classes and it occurred to me that it seemed very practical as well. And I liked my instructors. It wasn't in, in Hisco Hanchi. He wasn't the instructor for me directly at the time. It was actually just an, another uh, woman who was my own age who was teaching that class. Uh, but she'd been doing it since she was a child and she was extremely good and very fit and very inspirational. Um, I could relate to her, which was a big selling point to me. She moved like I moved. She was the same body type as me. And there's something a lot more that holds a lot more weight when the person you're learning from can relate to you. Mm -hmm. it's different from learning from somebody who's 300 pounds and six foot five and and then they tell you well you know you know you can't muscle it i'm like really that doesn't look like what you're doing i love that again since it over and i were just talking about that this morning where i have a new student who joined and she wanted to meet the other girl who's basically her size in class before she decided to join because she's not looking at me thinking she's going to do what i can do so I love that you're echoing that idea that sometimes who we look at at the club isn't the teacher, right? But this is, of course, my uneducated uh, perspective. So it's easier for me to look at somebody that I can connect with. I mean, when you're good enough, you can see that somebody who's large and strong, you can tell what they're not, if they're using their strength or not, you know. But back then when I had zero experience, it seemed like, the easiest way to evaluate was how are people like me able to do this? Love that. And then how did that lead to you going, I'm in for life. I want to be an instructor because <laughs> it, it wasn't much long after, right? If, I, if I'm not mistaken, you've been teaching for 27 years. And so it sounds like you knew pretty early on that this is something that mattered to you. Yeah, it the just the whole... Um, I liked that it was a non-competitive style, that the point of it was for personal development and and for self defense and i liked the confidence that it gave me and it gave other people and as i started to start uh, i started to assist with cl classes it felt good to be able to lift other people up through what we did um so to me like that was like a big part of it and that's why i you know latched onto it so to speak it made a significant impact on my personal life and for the rest of my life really <laughs> as you can tell well, talk about that. Talk about that early impact and uh, and what it changed for you or, or what it made you realize. Uh, well, it just, I wouldn't say it had like a, a specific epiphany. It was just like a whole bunch of mini epiphanies over the course of many years, just feeling more confident, you know, more, more comfortable in my skin, um, just being able to walk into a room without feeling like I couldn't take care of myself. I'm not saying that, you know, there aren't places where you should, you know, exercise caution or whatever, but but I always felt like once I've got to a certain place that I had some skills to rely on, not necessarily be reckless with them, but that that I had something to back me up as opposed to before that where you feel like, what if I was in this situation? I don't know what I would do. And that's a scary thought for many, many women. I bet it is. And me too. <laughs> um, a friend of mine who's like a chess master, he said, a plan is always better than no plan. Because I met, you know, the one time a guy wanted to fight me in high school, I was like, I don't know what to do. Even if you know what to do badly, it's still better than no plan. Um, talk to us about your path then with uh, Sensei Sylvain to becoming an instructor. Uh Oh, Professor Sylvain? Well, I was already, I was an instructor under Ed Hisko Hanshi. Um, okay. Professor Sylvain, he wasn't in the picture until, like, I was already, I already had my show done, maybe my knee done, I can't remember. Okay. But uh, he came back out of retirement 
and was doing so through my instructor's dojo. And so he started, you know, teaching, running these black belt classes, um, and then also right, creating videos, which I actually performed in for, you know, so that he could create, he did one on the persuader, some on nerve motor and pressure points, uh, high stress sparring drills, I think. I, I, I did work on a few of his videos as a demonstration model. Are those up anywhere? Can we send people to watch them? Are they still around? They were, they are ancient. Uh, I have no idea where you could find them. If it, I think if you got in touch with Ed Hiskohanji, I think he might have them digitized and, and is uh, able to reproduce them and sell them. I'd love to see some YouTube with like the fuzzy VHS, like adjust. Oh my God, it would be so fuzzy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love and I that. Look, and I'm like 21 in those videos. So it's like a long time ago. So as a young instructor, what was the greatest challenge? And this is a question we will go around the horn on because everybody here has taught a while. But as a young instructor, what was the greatest challenge for you starting to offer what you'd been offered? Hmm. What was the greatest challenge? It's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the greatest that anything that really stands out as a particular challenge um other than maybe the um you know so, uh, the occasional bout of um of, what do you call it um imposter syndrome mm. <laughs> like you know who am i to be teaching i've only been doing this for so many years there's so many people better than me yada 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 but i kind of that did, i i didn't really take that on too hard um because the people I was teaching were not coming in as experienced black belts and instructors. There are people who had no experience. And so I had a little bit of something to offer that they could start with. And as they learned, I learned. So, you know, I kind of just gained more confidence as a teacher, as I went and kept learning and developing my craft. Um, I guess the, there's sometimes there was like the odd occasions where it's not that the male students didn't take me seriously. It's just that sometimes they'd get, they'd be inappropriate um, either on the mats or in the, in the change room. But like, I don't, I just don't care. Like, it's funny to me, if anything. Um, they, and they, they still respected me on the mats and liked what I was teaching, but you know, doesn't change, doesn't stop people from locker room talk. <laughs> Um, let's go to you for this one, Sensei Suino. Let's uh, let's ask you your greatest challenge when you were a young instructor. I was my own greatest challenge as a young instructor. <laughs> um, <laughs> too much ego and um, not recognizing that the most important thing you can do with a new student is make sure they feel taken care of and recognized. Um, I was teaching to, for my own ego, not teaching to, to truly help them learn. Mm. Um, so that was my biggest challenge. Uh, and hundred percent, it was on me, but I mean, you know, I was 24 or something when I started teaching martial arts. So, uh, I'm going to give myself a little bit of a of forgiveness for it, but I, I, in a nutshell, that was it. I just, my, my ego was, was there and I was directing my energies in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sensei. Let's go to you, Sensei Dolphin. Your biggest challenge as a young teacher? I Well, my motivation wasn't the pedagogy of teaching, for sure. My motivation was because I looked at Sensei Legacy and said, well, he teaches martial arts, so for me to be like him, I have to teach martial arts. So I really initially was doing it as like a copycat type of a thing, and it was more about myself. Um Having said that, uh, you know, I became enamored with it, as you know, Sean, very quickly. I just really started to love teaching. Um, but other challenges, right? Like uh, Renchi O'Connell said it, there's imposter syndrome, right? Like you're standing in this room wearing a black belt and people are looking at you and you want to feel like you're going to have all the, be the sage, but you don't have all the answers. Um, but I was really taught early on by Sense of Legacy to just own that, right? I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm going to go find out for you. And lucky for me, I had a really good teacher with, with Sense Legacy. I would go talk to him like every week and I'd say stuff like, 
that guy that you sent to my dojo, Sean Benson, doesn't do what I tell him to do when he leaves. What can I do to make him listen to me? And then Sense of Legacy would say stuff like, well, you can beat the crap out of him. or you." Can. And so I chose that path with you a lot of times. Um, <laughs> but... But then that path with you, it was easy to like fight with you all the time. But then you got like Robert, who's five years old. I can't, right. when he's doing something wrong, I can't tell him to put his sparring stuff on and like smack him around the room. Although he'll tell you that I probably did that once or twice as well. Um, yeah, so I think those, some of those challenges are imposter syndrome, not really knowing what you're doing, figuring it out while you go, not looking at the individual people and thinking of the pedagogy of teaching those people. Um, and I guess the last challenge is really just to get students in the door, right? Like, how do you get them in? That's that's always a challenge in the beginning, right? You, I started with uh, six of you, and I'm happy with where it's grown to now, but that's definitely a challenge in the beginning. Thanks. Before we go to Hanchi, I just want to say a bit like you, Sensei Suido, my greatest challenge was myself, and it was my issues outside of class. It was being a consistent person who could show up day after day and do what I was telling the students they needed to do. Um, yeah, it was really hard to grow a club when people see you out at the bar, drunk or high, and you're not much of a role model at that point, even if the next day in the park, you're okay. But uh, yeah, I was definitely blended with another lifestyle that wasn't suited to the martial arts. So my greatest challenge was that. Hanchi Legacy, your greatest challenge as a young teacher back in the early 70s. What's up with that? Well, if you're a black belt, you're a teacher, you, you should have enough to teach them physically when you come in the door. But um, when you were, say, a new black belt would come in from another dojo and you know, it's your duty to be able to teach anybody who comes in that door. I think the biggest challenge was that when I said something to them, they didn't get it. So I had to have an alternative way of bringing them to the same point. And that, again, is just um, live and learn. You have to stay longer. You have to stay 30 years before you have a good grab on what martial arts really is. So I, I think... We all, as beginners, had the same problem, in my opinion. Thanks, Hanchi. And before we leave this topic, I want to go back to you, Sensei O'Connell, because when Sensei O'Fan mentioned students, you just went, oh, yeah. <laughs> Talk to us about that journey for you, where it started, where it is now. Just take your time and really talk us through what that was for you. And I know that COVID, I think you closed a dojo during that period. So talk to us about all of that. Well, I mean, it's easy when you are, it was easier when we were teaching out of university schools or, or at my instructor's school, but like, and when it wasn't in my responsibility to have to bring in students. And then in Japan, I kind of had like captive audience with the foreigners who were in that area. So like everybody knew I was teaching. So it was kind of easy to have a small class. But then when I moved, and when I moved to Vancouver, it started out, it, so well easy to get students because I was uh, in another school teaching a class within a, another school you know another dojo but I didn't need to make as much money to make my rent soon as I started having to be re entirely responsible for my own rent it became a hell of a lot more challenging to get the, the right amount of students because I had to increase the rates and by increasing the rates you stop getting as many students it's funny how that works out <laughs> Um, and then eventually I kind of got, I got rid of the dojo that I was like, I took over a dojo and then I was like, nope, like, this is not good. And then I, I went into like a Pilates school where I was re renting a space and I was able to do that. No problem. And go back to the, a good, consistent student base. And again, I moved around in different, you know, other martial arts schools, you know, raising my profile a little bit each time. And then I shared one unit with a boxing instructor. So he took the lower level and I got took the higher level. And that was fine. It was when I went to back into having entirely my own space where again, similar thing happened where it became more challenging to get enough students to make rent. And at that time though, I started, I was already working in film and had stunt work so I could use my film career to sub to kind of subsidize the dojo. Mm -hmm. But um once you know, once we got to the pandemic, it was just like 
I'm not making any money anywhere. The dojo in film, everything was shut down. Yeah. And I had a lease of two, you know, you know, 2,500 a month or whatever it was. And I was like, nope, I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to go bankrupt over this. So I got out of it. I got a, I got another leaser to take over the, the thing and, and got out. But uh, I'm looking forward to starting my new dojo, which is going to be in the basement of my home that I have full control over. And uh, it'll be pandemic proof and recession proof. And I can go back to teaching exactly how I want to teach and not worry about the numbers. So let's let's crack that open. What about numbers, aside from increased fees, would make the teaching different? Because there is a reality to, you know, even in, in post UFC, MMA, uh, you know, YouTube keyboard warrior type of world where you do have to kind of navigate a bit of that. So what would be the difference between a, you know, um, need to make rent proof martial art or, or the one that would attract a hundred students a month? Well, honestly, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to basically flipping the board game over of how I'm doing things. I'm changing the way I teach completely uh, in terms of structuring, uh, the instruction it's, I'm not going to have kids classes again I don't want it's not that I don't think there's a lot of value in teaching children it's just the stuff I want to be teaching is not really kid friendly um and I just want to teach what I want to teach I don't I want to teach for passion and not for money like and if money comes into it great but it's not my primary source of income I want to keep it as my um my a personal interest dojo um which and I also have the way I'm doing it. I'm I'm actually stripping out belts. I don't want to have belt belts anymore. I'm all teaching to the individual students that I have based on their unique body types, phys, you know, the, if they have any physical impediments, um, their age, whatever that happens to be. Like I'm not teaching a set curriculum. You have to learn this, this, and this to get to yellow belt, or this, this, and this to get to orange belt. It's going to be okay, well, how can I serve you, the individual best and make and, and give you the tools that you personally need that will make you, you know, like that will, you know, achieve the goals that you want to achieve. And of course, the goals have to be somewhat related in that we're teaching a martial art based around self-defense um, and personal growth. Um, but and if people want to compete, I will send them to other schools. And it is not what I do. It's not what I want to do. Um. I love that. Whether I would do that or not, I'm not sure. But the excitement at flipping the board game and at changing your pedagogy, we're definitely going to go around the horn on this one because it's a fun topic. Sensei Dolphin, belts, uh, curriculum, all that stuff. Would you change any of it if you literally were out in the woods and didn't have to worry about who was coming to train with you for rent or lights being being on? Uh, no, I wouldn't change anything. Sorry, that's just a really short answer. I yep. like the path I've been on. I like the way I've been taught. Um, I also have been teaching for a long time, uh, for 30 years now. And while not everybody likes the way I teach, I'm not going to cater everything I do to the way other people. Uh, Renchi O'Connell just said it. If you want to compete, she's going to send you somewhere else. And so I have no problem with that. I think that's a great... Great way to look at it. And that's the way I look at it too. If you don't want to do Legacy Sharanru and you don't want to do Mukso Jigadin Nishin Ryu Yaido, you don't want to do those things within the curriculum that I teach. Of course, I'll try and teach it to you slightly different. Then you're free to go some other place. And I'm okay with that. I won't be offended um, by that in any way. Um, on the numbers that you need, I've to run a commercial school like this, like a full time commercial school, uh, I often. Think of different lessons that my teachers give me. And one thing that Sensei Suino has often said to me when I start moaning and complaining about things, he'll say, are you going to quit martial arts? And I'm like, no, what are you talking about? He's like, then it's just logistics. It's just stuff mm. to be figured out. And I think when, if your goal is to be a martial arts teacher, like, and for me, you know, a really big goal is to make sure that these arts get passed on to somebody, right? And that then when I'm gone, it's moving forward. It's just all logistics to be figured out how to do that. And then you need people coming in the door to find the right people so that I can just happily pass away one day and it will just keep moving forward, <laughs> right? Which maybe that's morbid, but 
um, that's where I'm at in my martial arts jersey journey now. How, you know, a big goal for me is how can I die and know that this is going to keep moving forward? Thanks, Sensei. Um, my answer would be the same, although never say never in the sense that I've done this with my acting teaching, where I don't teach for money right now. I will only take on privates as mentors based on what the person needs in this very like finding Forrester kind of, wait, I hear that guy teaches now and then way and i like it but who knows we'll see what's going on with that in a year but in martial arts i'm i'm with that path that you're talking about hanchi legacy what about you um you know you've always kind of done your own thing but is there anything you would ever change if literally zero dollars was needed for martial arts in your life no because uh, i i think that let's use mma for instance um uh, most people join mma because it's almost like a shock shock factor or when there I had a guy said that to me once. I was sitting in a restaurant and uh, I, I went in for a dinner and the guy said, Are you gay? Like you say, I said, Yeah, he goes, I'm MMA. You know, they, they join that. They don't realize once you get in there, you get your face punched and your groin kicked and everything else in there. So there'd be a I find you'd probably be a higher drop up. From that, once mm. the first shot of a punch in the face. Whereas, when you join a martial arts club or martial arts, you're not fighting another fighter. You're defending yourself against someone who mostly doesn't know martial arts, and that's a better way. You'll you'll get more people doing that and staying. That's the key word. And staying. Um, then someone who gets like beat up really badly without any type of control, right? So I wouldn't change anything. I, I think martial arts, classical martial arts are the best way of learning self-defense, mainly because it works on you building from the inside as opposed to fighting other people. Same as like doing sports. Sports give you a certain amount of confidence but it gives you doesn't give you confidence for everything else. But martial arts is a completely unique and different animal than just being an opponent. It's an internal builder. So I think more people are actually looking for that than how many pe people are successful as MMA fighters. Thank you, Anchi. Um, Sensei Suino, you're living in the woods. You're doing your thing. You're only teaching who shows up. They don't pay you. You don't care. Do you change anything? Nope. Uh, I have to echo what Randy said, but before I do, I just have to remind him that he's about 10 years younger than I am, and I'm going to live to 150. So there's going to be a while before he gets to die and leave his dojo to somebody else. <laughs> um, uh, sorry. And then would I change anything? No, uh, what Hanshi Legacy really re said really re uh, resonates with me. Um, I think the most valuable things that we do in martial arts are about changing character, about teaching people from the inside. Self-defense is great. Winning sports is great. Being a badass is great. Um, but I truly believe that the most important work we do is helping people become deeper, more confident, better members of society. Um, and I try to do that now and, you know, pay the bills. It works well. I've got a big dojo, um, but I am lucky, I think, or blessed. I got a big dojo doing the teaching martial arts the way I think it should be taught, not teaching for money. Mm. Um, I want to add one thing before I go back to Sensei O'Connell. You know, the other night I was teaching a brand new student, a Soto Uke, cross body block. And I've been teaching less than everybody on this call. Um but I do want to, and maybe this is a selfish idea, but I threw my favorite cross body blocks I've ever thrown in my life while showing her. And the one thing I do like about the curriculum is that when I bring students through it, it keeps me sharp because I could very well let go of some of the basics if I didn't have to show them on a regular basis through a curriculum. So maybe it's a selfish thing. And again, it's almost like sobriety. Like we help keep other people sober to keep ourselves sober. And so Maybe when I've taught as long as everybody on the call, it won't be about me, but it still is in some way where I'm like, oh, thank God I have to work through this program often 
because otherwise I'm not, I might get lazy. Um, Sensei O'Connell, I want to go back to you because when Hanchi Legacy talked about building the inside, you lit up, you nodded, and I just want to know um, why that excited you so much and, and what attracts you to that idea or what do you want to echo? That's just entirely why I got into the, got so involved in the martial arts was that one element. Like if I go to any school, if they're not, if that element isn't there, I don't want to train there. Like I'll train with an instructor with less experience with me as me that's teaching something different that I, you know, will enjoy learning. But if they have that spirit and that their students have that spirit, if they don't have that spirit and it's being taught out of ego or accolades or the promise of the next bell, then I'm out of here. Like I, I'm, I want, I, there has to be that element in my book for it to be what I care about. Um, we have a question for you. This came from one of my students. Her name's Allison Adams. And uh, she says, hi, Sensei. My name is Allison. I'm a student of Sensei Sean Benson. Couldn't make it on the call, but you sound like an all around badass when I read your website. <laughs> and she phrases this question in a way. She says, you know, the men you're talking to right now have been amazing and inspiring on my journey of three years. But it really makes a difference when I see a woman in a high ranking position uh, who can not only fight but grapple. Um, her question is, when you find yourself in an elongated period where you seem to be hitting a wall with your training, where nothing is advancing and maybe even worsening, is there something you do or something you say to yourself? Sometimes in my training, I feel that can last for weeks on end and I could feel really shitty. I'm also impatient. Does it get easier with more experience and more hours in? Or can I expect these periods often throughout my whole life in the martial arts? I think those periods will always be there. Um, but the important thing is to find the joy in what you're doing. So it doesn't matter. Like I, I experienced many of those periods, uh, over the course of my training. Um, but if I was enjoying what I was doing, it didn't matter so much. And I could just trust that I, whatever lessons I needed to learn were going to come. Right on. Um, that's really simple and love it. I'm I'm laughing a little and I can laugh because it's my student at the idea that sometimes it lasts for weeks. I'm like, Jesus, <laughs> Christ, I've had some fucking plateaus last for years where you're like, why is this not? And then boom. So my God, if only they could only last weeks. <laughs> so let's say don't fanny thoughts days. on that. We, you know, we won't go full around the horn, but I just saw you laughing at the idea of weeks. Well, I mean, uh, this is another lesson that uh, I learned from Sense Legacy is I would go sit in the car with him to go for a lesson and he'd say, what's been going on this week, Randy, in your training? And I'd say, oh, you know, Sensei, this kata, this particular foot sweep, this movement, it's going so good. I feel so great, blah, blah, blah. And he'd say, that's amazing. You know what you need to do? You need to get your ass in the dojo and you need to train a lot. Work on that. Keep riding that wave. And then sometimes I go to him and say, I can't do it since I cannot do this thing. Like you're telling me to do this thing and I can't do it. I keep getting my ass kicked over and over. I'm not getting any better at it. It's been months now. It's been a year. And since they always said, Randy, the answer is in the dojo. You have to get in the dojo and you have to practice that more and more and more. And lucky uh, as Renchi O'Connell just said, I loved being in the dojo and I still love being in the dojo mm -hmm. and there's a lot of joy there for me. So it's easy for me to do that because um, maybe I'm a bit obsessed with this, but uh, the answer to Allison and anybody is Sense of Legacy's answer to me, get in the dojo. If it's going good, get in the dojo and keep working on that thing. And if it's not going good, get in the dojo and figure that shit out. Cause the answers are all on the dojo floor, not some other place. Love that. Sensei Suino, talk to us about plateaus. Well, I just wanted to chime in that uh, uh, one of my early judo teachers, Walter Todd, he was a, a pioneer in judo uh, in the early days here in the USA. He always used to say that he had, he, he would say, when someone was disappointed, discouraged, he would say, I envy the person who's on a plateau. And we're like, why, Sensei? And he says, because I know they're consolidating their gains, right? They are in a position where they're going to be, they're not going to feel like they're learning for a long time, but this is the time when you build, you build, you get your, you get all the pieces together, you consolidate, and I know they're going to, they're going to rock it forward. 
Um, he said it with a lot more character and flavor than I just did, but uh, <laughs> I think the concept is good. <laughs> I love that. Hanchi Legacy, what do you say to somebody who's hitting plateaus of weeks or dare I say sometimes even longer? Uh, you already heard it, I told Randy. Uh, the one thing I would like to say, though, uh, to Reggie O'Connell is that what Akoshi said, um, the human consists of a body, mind, and spirit. You have to train on all levels. That's why I want to stay in the dojo. And to most everybody's surprise, Buddha is the guy who actually started the physical movements of martial arts. And it was, in fact, a, the mind that he was really trying to train. But mm. um, the mind and the spirit are more than the body, but they can't live without it. So you ultimately have to train the body on a physical level, but it's the higher human that you really need to train. And I don't, I'm not saying they don't, but I mean, in MMA, the goal is different. It's physical. So I, I think that's what keeps us as classical martial artists in the dojo. You know, and why an old part like me can still teach martial arts is because there's just, more to the punching and kicking. Mm. Thanks, Hanchi. The, the first time I heard it said was by you, and then easily 10 more times with Sensei Dofa in our early days in the park. I'm here to train your mind. Your body goes along for the ride. And I've never forgotten that. And I've never not relied on, you know, I don't know if I'm tough physically, but mentally, I think I've gotten something out of the martial arts. Sensei O'Connell, before we go to your 10 questions, um, Again, I just, I'm always clocking the screen and I saw you light up when Hanshi talked about the Buddha and those early days of the, maybe the point of all of this. Um, do you want to add anything to that? Or is it just something you liked hearing? I've heard those stories too. And then the uh, idea was, was the goal of, of being able to meditate longer and which was for the purposes of, you know, personal enlightenment and growth, but like, if the body is weak, the mind can't grow. You can't develop that. And so I think the exercises were designed to help in encourage, allow people to withstand longer periods of meditation and, and be able, and in some cases, fight against the uh, people who are trying to infiltrate their, their, their shrines and stuff. It self, so the self-defense elements kind of came in. So anyway, I just think that if we do remember that the, uh, the, at the core of all of the the classical martial arts, the uh, mental part was always there. It's important for us to take that lesson into our teachings and trainings. Um, I love the way you just said that. I mean, I know you're reiterating a bit, but the idea that you just said it so clearly that if your body's weak, you can't train your mind properly. And, um, you know, I know there's some people who are disadvantaged physically, but generally speaking, I know a lot of professors who would benefit from having dug into the physical a little more and looking at a totality therefore and not a sliver. Um, it's time for your 10 questions. We ask these of all our guests. Now we ask that you answer impulsively, but then feel free to break open your answer as you wish. What okay. is the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal? Most effective move? Is yeah. there one? Is that even possible to say there's only one? Honestly, uh, martial arts arsenal is my voice. <laughs> like I scare people with my, uh, when I yell at them. Um, so when I combine that with any martial arts move and it, it's coming from that deep kind of like scary way, like when I'm giving a command or, or telling somebody to get away from me in that bad dog kind of way, like I've like scared people who know it's coming just with my voice and then they, they startle and then I can do whatever I want after that because it's just so startling. So yeah, I'm going to say it's my voice. Um, who is the most influential martial artist in your life? <laughs> uh, who is the most influential martial artist in my life that's alive? Maybe not in your life. Uh, I'm Oh, that is a hard question to answer um, because it's it's spread out over so many different people and so many different lessons. Um, 
who would I, you know what, I'm going to say Corey Great in this, uh, in terms of how she's influenced my path in terms of instruct. Siku Corey Great is an instructor I met in the National Women's, in the uh, some of the women's martial arts uh, organizations in the States. I first met her at PAMA, which is the Pacific Association of Women's Martial Arts, um, where I was invited to teach. Uh, and I also, you know, met with her and taught at National Women's Martial Arts Federation camps. But at every one of these camps, and anytime I have had challenges, uh, I kind of reached out to her and asked her questions, um, you know, and and got inspiration from her in how in kind of take in taking my own path and moving forward with that and trusting in my own my instincts and also finding my confidence as an instructor at some of these events because what I I remember in the early days when I was first started teaching at them and she I was finding it overwhelming how many students were coming up to me during my lunch breaks and outside of the classes and telling gushing about how much how, uh, how how helpful what I taught was and how it would like how much influence it had on them and I just you know I'd often answer it's like oh you know like it, the students made the class or you know, like it was all in the atmosphere and like you guys are what made it and she told me no don't do that that's wrong and I was like what Oh, I thought it was just, I honestly thought it was right just to be humble. And she's like, it's not a question about being humble. It's by telling them that you're not the reason why, you're not part of the reason why they enjoyed that class. You're telling them they're wrong about you and that they're wrong to to see you as an authority in what you do. So she taught me to ask questions, you know, say, to thank them as my first response, to, you know, thank and be gracious. And then to ask them what they found most useful in my in the class that I taught, so that I can learn from them what's working. So things like that. I think the, she's just a brilliant instructor and a brilliant leader in the martial arts women's martial arts community. And she's not even my style, and I, I haven't even trained tons with her. But it's just the way she approaches teaching and and dealing with people and that spirit of the martial arts that we were talking about that we say like that I think is the most important part. I get that a lot from her. And so she is my biggest, sorry, no, sorry to say she, I'd say she's the one who has had the most influence on me in my later years. Amazing. Uh, who do you think is the most influential martial artist of all time and why? Of all time? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a good thing you told me not to look up these questions ahead of time and, and answer honestly. Of all time. Mm. Mm. Is Buddha a martial artist? <laughs> Can we say Buddha? Absolutely. Why do you think that? Uh, I, uh, because of what I'm saying uh, that the the he's you know like he was the one that made it all about the the personal growth, the uh, the mental development, you know, like it, the how we are connected to the world. In, you know, like, I just think that that is, if, of all the things that are important in martial arts, that's the most important thing. And that's the one common thread in all of them, or at least I think it should be. What excites you most about the next five years of your training? Hmm. What's exciting me most is developing, uh, like, is exploring and deepening my, new, this new approach that I'm taking towards teaching. Um, it's not that the moves that I'm teaching are so are so much different. It's the approach to teaching it that are different. And I'm learning lessons all the time. Like right now, I don't have my dojo up and running yet, but I've been running a martial arts study group with a, a number of like-minded, you know, people who used to train with me like 20 years back in the day who heard I was back. And I said, well, I'm working out these this new approach and I'd love to have you come in and, you know, train in my basement with me while I kind of refine my teaching approach. And I just, every time I teach, I'm learning something new. I'm taking notes. I'm kind of like, oh, that worked. That didn't work. Um, I'm, and to me, that's very exciting for my own personal development. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get there? Welcome. That's what sets the legacies. <laughs> um. Do you have a favorite film and television martial artist, action star, whether they're great at martial arts or not? 
You must. Michelle Yao. She's yes. the best. I love Michelle Yao. Not just for, uh, not in terms of martial arts only. Like she's an inspiration as a human being. If I could meet one person in film, I would. That would. I would love to meet her. And I, I, I was invited. I was asked if I was available to be submitted for Section Thirty One, which she's still. She just finished filming in Tur Toronto, and was like, "Oh, I'm, I'm available." please, please pick me because it was a picture cast role. So there's only one role and, you know, they're picking from a bunch of people. Sadly, I did not get that role, but, but, but like, uh, one of these days it would be amazing to meet her. She is such an inspiration. Like the way she handled the Oscars and the way she, she's just such, she's older and she's like strong and she's everything I hope I am when I'm her age. Yeah. Um, fun fact, an ex-girlfriend of mine was shooting Star Trek with her the whole first season. And however oh. nice or professional or amazing you think she is, 10 times more. Just I have heard that. Everyone I've talked to cares. said she is exactly what you expect her to be. No ego, just there. Yeah. Um, love her. Um, do you have a martial artist living or dead in all of recorded history that you'd want to train with the most? Living or dead? Uh, if Wing Chun it was real, the the like the light legend of Wing Chun, the woman who started it all, I would love to train with her. I know there's a lot of shrouded in mystery, and uh, when you know, like I know they say that she was a real woman who existed, who and who was the the founder of the original style of Wing Chun, and you know, learned to use her small her petite stature to develop this art. Like, but it's so it's such an old story that who knows how much of how accurate and how true. Like, people can can't really fact check it, right? But if that legend is true, and she was a real person and did develop it as they say she did, I, I would love to learn from her. Um, if none of the martial arts you've studied existed, what art would you want to train the most, and why? Sorry, if none of, repeat the question again? None of the arts you do exist. Oh, what yeah. do you then go take and why? What, okay. Uh, oh, geez, I've trained in a lot. The ones <laughs> that I, I'm not, not training in currently or. However you want to take. Of, you know, I, I think I would try to find another style. Like, I like the, a lot of Filipino martial arts that are really cool, but there's, there's so many streams of it. So maybe I would go to the Philippines and, you know, explore a bunch of streams and then, you know, and try to figure out which one, you know, has the lessons I want to learn most. Um, but I do, I have been really enjoying Filipino martial arts training and, and blending it with my jujitsu. Right on. Uh, our last two questions come as a pair. What is your greatest achievement? What is your greatest regret? my greatest achievement are we talking in life or in martial arts however you want to think about it <laughs> um greatest achievement um, that is a tough one um, and regret man Achievements. Well, just think my greatest achievement has been coming into the person, the person that I am, like, mm. just stop no longer caring about what other people think and just living my life on my own terms. It's not a specific achievement. I'm perhaps I'm not really handling the question the way you want me to, but uh, it's affected everything I do in my life. I feel very stable and grounded in any conversation I come into, um, any challenge I face. Like I just trust in that I that I don't it may, I don't have to have all the answers, but if I'm true to my values and who I am as a person, then that's the best I can do in any situation. Um, so just having that kind of approach to life, I think, has been my greatest achievement. Um, now, in terms of regrets um, <sighs> the best right now because it's been such a challenge um I can't think of anything else offhand but um 
but uh, not doing more homework about what was going to be involved in building a house and mm. realize and, and and knowing how much you know like and and like you you don't realize how contractors like go crazy and in, in giving you telling you it's going to be this price but they're gonna, all of a sudden it's four times that price and then you know not and not understanding how the whole thing works and so like it's taken like we thought we were going to be in our new house in like four, four to six months and we've been sitting here now it's been almost two years and we're about to move in finally <laughs> but um it's been a lot I wish I had done taken a more rigorous approach to planning it and and digging deeper into what's involved in it rather than just throwing money at it and thinking okay this is going to all work out somehow um maybe a, a bit more caution and a bit more research would have been a good idea but I don't regret having done it though because I, I wanted to move back here and like the whole point was to move back to Ottawa from Vancouver, you know, with my partner, because we both have family here and we lived in Vancouver. We had a successful life there, but the pandemic made us realize that we were missing a lot of the things that were most important to us because all our family is in Ottawa and we weren't able to see them for two years during the pandemic. And that kind of, we'd always thought we'd move back to be closer to our families, but that kind of, moved it motivated us to do it sooner rather than later even though we didn't know how that was going to work how we were going to work in film because ottawa is not exactly a huge film location that toronto is so we thought okay well maybe we can make something work where we're commuting and working in toronto and so there was a lot of uncertainties around it but we made a huge decision to make that move and i still don't regret it because i'm so much happier having made the move even with all the crazy challenges with the build um, and we're going to have the life that we want. And we, and honestly, even with those challenges, I do have the life I want, essentially. I mean, I'm closer to family. I'm living from my own personal truth. I'm teaching. Like, I don't have my dojo yet, but that'll come. You know, I just have to trust in the process. And I am mm-hmm. working in, in stunts in Toronto. And I've been having some pretty good uh, opportunities there. I got to stunt double in Star Trek. And, like, it's like... Star Trek is like one of my favorite things in the world when it comes to film. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, total side note: I'll, I'll find you after, but a friend of mine runs a production company in Ottawa, and I'll make sure you guys meet, and that way he knows you're there for stunts and acting. Um, Excellent. We, yeah, abs- absolutely. I'll find you on Insta after. Um, so, two questions we got that came in. So these are for you. These are not uh, round the horn ones from um, Bob Wolf. The question is. What do you think is the most important thing a woman who's thinking of training sees, feels, or perceives when first visiting a dojo? What 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 should they be looking out for? That they they that they feel it, that it, it is a safe um, and inclusive training environment. Because if you don't have safety and inclusivity, if you don't feel like you belong, you are not going to class. You will just you might stick it out for a little while. I, I've done it myself in the past, you know, stuck it out for a little while because stubbornly, like in Japan. But uh, after a while, it just it will wear you down. And if your purpose is to train and to learn lessons through your training, if it's not inclusive and it doesn't, or it doesn't feel safe, you're either going to get hurt or you're going to get demoralized. And I think the, the latter is even worse than the, than the, the being hurt. Bodies, bodies recover demoralization you might never go back to another martial arts school because you get so turned off by that first early experience yep um and then uh, another question from scott taylor friend of the show his question is what was sensei's favorite show or movie to work on to work on oh okay i'm gonna have to say siren because you know the siren was my first role where I was the stunt double for a main character. She was like the main, the lead mermaid on the show. And it, I was there a lot and I got to do a lot of different things. I got to do a car hit. I got to, I got to fight. Yes, mermaid fighting on land. It was great. And underwater fighting. Who knew that that, that was something that existed and there'd be a need for. And I, I did a lot of free diving work, obviously. Um, but it just like, it was great because I was part of a team and 
and I got to build relationships with my actress, with the other stunt performers, with my stunt coordinator and Ed Anders. Um, so to me, that was one of the best times of my life in stunts because I, I trained, I, I worked on it for three seasons and and it was just good to be part of a team. But as part as far as a single role where I've kind of been excited about and enjoyed the show that I was working on, it's, you know, Star Trek um, Strange New Worlds recently, which just happened in January. And I always said that I cannot end my film career until I've worked on a Star Trek. Not that I'm looking to end my film career by any stretch, but I was like, I have to work on a Star Trek because I'm a huge Star Trek fan. So getting to work on Star Trek was just was like walking onto the Enterprise. I'd be like through the halls. I'm like, this is for real. I'm here. So I'm. W- would your number two favorite action star of all time be Kirk with that judo chop and <laughs> double hand on the back? And, I oh mean, yes. Cause... Oh the, uh, the, the <laughs> <laughs> those shows were hilarious. They were hilarious. All all jokes aside, I mean, those early Star Trek episodes, the, the late 60s ones, they absolutely had some rollicking fight scenes for me as a young kid watching. I mean, they're dated, but they were delightful and there were a lot of them. Um, it, it's funny, Sensei Suido actually just kicked a question over, so I want to throw it to him um, because I want to hear the answer to this too. I know it's a martial arts chat, but um, you guys have been talking a little bit about the film industry while we have you on the show, what's something about the film or TV industry that an ordinary person might not know, you know, that you know because of your insider insider status? Might not know. Like, in what context? Um, I don't know. Is there something about, um, is there something about stunt work, like the way you trick us into believing that that's the person doing the thing? Or, um, um, you know, how much time do you have to spend walking around trying to act and, and look like the actress that you're stunting for before you can pull off a good stunt. I don't know. I mean, it's just such a mystery mm. to folks like me. Well, I think th- the one thing that the people are often most surprised by, and this is a very, very specific um, one for me is in terms of firework. Like they, they ask me, I'm like, I'm like, have I literally set on full on fire, like full body, body burn. And uh, so people asking like, oh my God, was like, what did that feel like? Was it was it, was it hot? And I was like, actually no, it's really cold. It's what? really cold uh, oh. because they cover you in all this fireproof gel that's extremely cold, and you're sitting oh. around waiting for the shot to happen in this cold gel for like over an hour, and you're like, oh my God, I'm so cold. <laughs> and he's like, I just want them to light me on fire and get this thing over <laughs> with, so I can stop being Love so it. cold. Very cool. And I'm, I'm like somebody who's worked in a lot of cold environments too, because I've done cold water work as as a as a as a free diver and like doing water stunts. But there's just something about sitting in this gel that's so and like that's the most unpleasant part about it is just the being cold in the gel. It's like it's not what people think. If you feel any kind of warmth whatsoever in a fire burn, it's going wrong. You're not supposed to feel any heat ever. So they say if you feel any warmth at all you drop down and do whatever the safety thing is that you're supposed to do. Usually it's just lay down and then they put you out. But uh, anyway, that's the one thing I would say. Cool. Um, before I do a little follow-up to that one, Sensei Suino, I can tell you something. Now, I don't do the stunts, remember? I have someone do them for me, but I know that Sensei Dofan Hanchi Legacy will verify what I'm about to say. It's boring as fuck. <laughs> shooting is boring as fuck action to cut is amazing every time but the day on set is boring as fuck now maybe not for the stunties because they're doing the real work um <laughs> but mm-hmm. the days yeah, we sit around long, a lot too don't worry <laughs> right they are long and they're slow the reward is great and i don't mean financially sometimes it isn't i mean action to cut but um uh what i wanted to add to that question uh sensei o'connell is a lot of martial artists think, well, I want to get into stunts. Um, you know, it's a pretty common idea. And so my question is, if a martial artist came to you and said, hey, I want to get into stunts, I obviously can do it. What would you say they need to learn that they don't realize they don't know? They need to learn how to modify their martial arts uh, so that it works for film. Because mm. real martial arts is different from film fighting. 
Um, I had to learn that. Everyone, every other martial artist I know had to learn that. There's a difference because you have to learn how to sell it so that you're hitting it without actually hitting people. You also need to do it in a way that shows for camera. Like we all know these really tiny wrist locks that hurt and are highly effective and they work in the real world, but you put that on camera and it looks fake. I mean, everybody has said that, you know, like you look at some, some of the greatest martial artists on camera, you look at what they do and it looks like they're barely doing anything. It's because it's all like this tiny circular movements that are almost indetectable on camera, which is the opposite of what you want for film. So yeah, they, they need to learn that. Um, they also uh, just need to learn how to be on set, you know, so maybe do some background work uh, or like being an extra for a little bit to see what an on-set environment is like. Right on. Uh, I think that's a huge one. Yeah, I, I haven't done real stunts for camera, but on on stage, my fight captains are always like, you need, you, you can't hide your move. You have to show your move, which is quite literally the exact opposite of what we're trying to do. Um, we have a question from Al Panaki. He's been a guest on our show. He's a friend of the show. We absolutely love this man. What would be a typical workout for you in Can Ryu? Uh, what would the Rendori look like? Like, Talk us through that because that that has come up on our show a bit, and he's curious. A typical workout. Um, in Ken Ryu, the way I'm doing it, I guess. I mean, um, more traditionally, it would be they do have a warm up. Um, they do break falls. They do some striking. Um, they do some hold escapes or some sort of self defense applications, and then maybe a cool down. That that's basically what the the standard would be usually and sometimes you know they throw in like a jujitsu circle where there's a little bit of a randori like element uh, or sometimes sparring too like depending on the school like we've done some sparring in the past too um it's gonna be very different when i start my new school but uh but all the elements will be there um i'm just going to be mixing them up depending on what i'm going to be teaching on the day and which students i have on my mat Right on. So you've got the breadth of knowledge, but you, you don't have a specific plan laid out based on. Well, there'll be a warm up for sure, because <laughs> I don't want anyone to get hurt. Um, yeah. And but I'm going to do my warm ups more specifically based on the, like I want to do technical warm ups, like warm ups where we're actually using the moves we're working on as the warm up. Um, that's something I kind of been learning from some fitness like. With strength training, you warm up, like if you're doing warming up for strength training, you warm up the movement with less weight. So there's elements of that in mentality that I would like to do rather than just, okay, let's just do a bunch of push-ups and sit-ups. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not here to get you fit. I want to have a very condensed time with my students and then really focus on the learning of the martial arts. And like, you can go, fit. there's lots of places to go get fit. I want to teach martial arts. Um, so uh, I'm not going to be doing a ton of... Uh, like the you know football the fitness elements i know that might hurt my uh dojo because a lot of people are like i just want to get fit i'm like well if you're doing really good martial arts you might not you you don't necessarily like the fitness element might not be there as much because once you get really good you become efficient and then you don't use your muscles as much so you still have to train your body but you can do that at the gym you don't need me to do that um Sensei O'Connell, that's literally one of the things that was said to me and made me join our karate club 31 years ago, was all the other clubs were pitching fitness. And I remember asking the guy, Al Menesis, I said, uh, will you get like, are we doing push-ups, sit-ups? He goes, a bit, but you're here to learn karate. <laughs> and I was like, I want to go there. <laughs> and I, I I like that you take that approach as well. Um Sensei, before we go around the horn where we talk about our time with you, is there anything you want to say? You'll have the last word, by the way, but is there anything we haven't touched on that you want to make sure we address about your path or your journey or your, your new school before we say a little word about you? Um, only that um that my with my journey and what I'm doing with my new school, I'm aiming to make martial arts playful again. Or I don't know if it's even again. Was it ever playful? I, it must have been for somebody at some point in history. <laughs> um, but uh, some, sometimes, and like I know, there's lots of different approaches. And if you're doing it for like law enforcement or like other like very serious approaches, like sometimes you're gonna have to have elements of seriousness. But like I want my school to be a place where it 
life isn't serious as much like that it's playful and fun and people enjoy their time there um and that people are not afraid to make mistakes because and they're not going to get barked at and give push-ups for for making a mistake you know like it's supposed if, if you're doing like life is too short and you know the pandemic has kind of brought so much seriousness to everybody's life um i just want to be people to see this as a haven of you know where they they can like let the pressures of the world go and just focus on learning something fun um and useful <laughs> yeah that word does exist um i don't know which podcast it is but joe rogan talks about his jujitsu exactly that way he says it's got to be playful he says playful is where you're going to learn playful is where you're going to win lose experiment um I'm going to make an executive here. I think we have time for this question because I think it's an important question. I think some people can learn from it. From Debbie Markle, has the boys club bravado or flat out disrespect you've mentioned, uh, has it ever disrailed you on the spot or over time led someone to become unteachable? I know you kind of answered this earlier, but I thought we might touch upon it again. It has derailed me on the spot uh, when I was young, when, 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 um, like I remember I was in the middle of teaching a class and my uke commented right in front of the class, your hair smells really great. I'm like, what the hell? He said it in front of everybody. I was just like so derailed. It was not, it, it, like, I, I was like, that is not the thing to be talking about right here, right now. <laughs> But, but it definitely, I was flabbergasted that somebody thought to say that while I was teaching it in front of the class. Um, so that's the quick answer for the on the spot thing. So, and the, uh, what was the other Over time has anyone uh, become unteachable? <laughs> <laughs> Over time has anyone become unteachable? No, because, because they wouldn't have joined my dojo in the first place. Right. Um, like people like that don't end up at a dojo where a woman is the, the lead instructor the head instructor they just don't so it's kind of like a natural weeding process that gets rid of like the super like super male chauvinistic uh, ego driven um you know people who want that like martial artists they, they just don't end up in my do in my dojo which some people like you know because then the other the students don't have to deal with people like that either yeah, that makes total sense. Um, thanks for that answer. Uh, thanks for that question, Debbie Markle. Hanchi Legacy, what do you want to say about our time with Sensei O'Connell today? Uh, it was a great time. First thing I'd like to tell her is that Wing Chun founder was a real person and defeated many male challengers in her day. That's why that Wing Chun bouncing off the che chest and going up under the chin and knocking them out. That actually happened. As far as I know, uh, there are other ladies like Bang Chin Yang who invented White Crane, which all karate Okin after Okinawa based is derived from. And um, Yaramani Tsuru defeated many, multiple men at the same time while they were armed. She'd kick him in the crotch, and when he bent over, to, she'd break their necks with side kicks. Those things actually. I'm sorry, but that's where martial arts comes from, right? Those three mm -hmm. ladies, absolutely uh, big names in martial arts. Uh, the other thing is I really appreciate your many achievements that you have in your martial arts, your short martial arts life. You probably will achieve many more in different ways. And I also appreciate that you realize that there's more than just training the body that the mind and the spirit are greater than the body, but you have to train it along. You know, it can't, your mind and body can't live, excuse me, your mind and your spirit can't live with your body. So you have to train it as well in order to be able mm -hmm. to achieve the other two things. I really liked our time with you. It was one of the best times that we've had. And I'd like to thank you for coming on to our show. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks, Hanchi. Sensei Suino. And this was a great conversation. Um, uh, your conversation about being in Japan and being treated like a gaijin brought many memories back for me. <laughs> <laughs> I got to enjoy that experience for four years, but I also uh, made relationships with some of the best people in my life. So uh, to be fair, 
both sides of that equation are out there. Um, listen, this was kick-ass. I think you share some of my sort of entrepreneurial D, uh, ADD, um, jumping from one thing to another, but then getting really good at stuff and being able to come back to it, share it with others. Um, it's cool to have learned a little bit about your career today. I've been looking at your website and and uh, you know stalking you on social media while we've had this chat. And so I know a whole, whole lot more and um, looking forward to following your career as it goes forward. It's fascinating to watch. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Thanks, Sensei Suino, Sensei Dofa. Uh, Sensei O'Connell, I, I always write in these books while talking, you're talking, taking notes. And someday when I die and somebody takes his dojo over after Sensei Suino is like 150 and I'm like 170, they're going to find all these notebooks and your name is going to be in there with like <laughs> Chuck Merriman Sensei and Jean Frenette Sensei and all these people that we've interviewed, which... You deserve to be in there with them. Like you're very wise and you have very deep thoughts. Really excellent to talk to you. Right from the beginning, we were talking about Gaijin in Japan. Like some people would not like that. I liked it personally. And those people who don't like it, we don't care. Um, uh, I like that you started in fencing. Um, I have a black belt. His name is Kendall Hutchins. And he, um, when he left here to go to Brock University, uh, he did fencing for their varsity team and he loved it. And he would talk to me about it because I don't even think anybody on this call knows this, but I actually tried fencing about four times at the university of Windsor. Um, Cause I'm from Windsor and the instructor there said that um, even though I'm not a huge person, uh, she just said, your upper body is too big and you're not going to be good at this. Cause it's going to be too easy wow. for people. To, to... <laughs> so, so I left with my big chest Aww. And went and found karate instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I like that you said you could relate to the instructor and that's why you joined. That is exactly the reason why I joined with Sense of Legacy is because when I saw him and heard him, he reminded me of things and showed me things that I wanted to be. And that's why I joined with him. So I can relate to you on that. Um <clears throat> That you joined because it was not competitive. It was an effective self-defense. And that's why you chose Ken Ryu Jiu-Jitsu. Um, I think it's exciting. And I think I'd love to, in six months or nine months, after you get your dojo going, to get another short going with you about the way you want to teach and how it's going. Because I think um, if you're doing some innovative things, a lot of people could learn from that. If there's no trade secrets, TMs, trademarks that you <laughs> don't want to share, but... I always like to learn from instructors. And if there's things that you're finding that are working really well, it would be really good to learn those things. Um, mm. Plateaus are always going to be there. I love that conversation. I like that you said your voice was your most powerful weapon, that a lot of more people should use their voice. Um, obviously, uh, um, the Sifu Kori Gate, you have a lot of admiration for her and what she taught you. That came out clearly. You're the first one to ever say Buddha is the most influential martial artist of all time. And I think that's like dropping the hammer. I'm not sure who's going to be able to ever <laughs> say somebody more influential than that. I think you just like, you ended the debate. Um, oh, I cheated. Uh, Hanchi was the one who brought that up. <laughs> right oh that's okay then the two of you you, you learned from hunchy and then you 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 <laughs> passed it on for everybody um you were very excited to say that michelle yao you, there was no hesitation on that one like you instantly lit up and smiled and said that that was your favorite martial artist uh, tv martial artist um like the discussion about the founder of wing chung um you said some, there's some sound bites. You said trust in the process that, you know, just have trust in the process. That is true. We all agree. Um, I think for ladies, for sure, but for anybody, you do find a safe and inclusive environment to train. Like you should, everybody should find that um, because you're right. If you become injured or demoralized or beat down or bullied, then that might sidetrack you on a lot of things. So I do think everybody, that was a great question from, said to Markle, and I, I'm really happy with that answer. Um, when you talked about playful, my mind uh, always tries to find a cinema. Well, the first thing I thought about were my BJJ coaches who, when you like have a broken rib, they just kind of start laughing uh, or you break your ankle and they're just like, ah, just part of the life. And they're all, and the whole room's just laughing at you while you're trying to tape up your foot. 
But, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but one thing I think uh, playful to me is a little bit like curious, right? Like I think if you're playful, you're curious about the possibilities and how to use and I think that's a good thing to be is playful and curious. I, I definitely think it has a strong place in martial arts. Um, and in the very end, you said something about uh, that martial arts. We all have talked about this, but you said it about, you know, if a male comes to a female instructor and I don't think it matters, male, female. I think if you come to an instructor, you said there's a natural weeding out process. And that's our job is to make sure that the martial arts, whether you're male or female, that the martial arts weeds out the wrong people who are not supposed to be in martial arts. That's when you said that, that's what resonated with me. So thank you so much for coming on today. Really happy to chat with you. Learned a lot from the, the discussion and look forward to having you on again and seeing you again. I know our paths will cross. Well, thank Thanks, you. Sir. That was a lot. Uh, thank you for all your insights. Um, so I just want to say very quickly, cause I get to speak so much during the show that I look forward to seeing you on set and in the dojo. I have a feeling both are going to happen sooner than later. Um, I'll find you on Instagram after to, to send you that DM about my friend, but, uh, let's throw the last word to you. What, uh, what, what do you want to go out on today? Hmm. Well, I think I'd like to just go out on the idea that, you know what, uh, sensei Randy Dothan was, you know, he was just saying, uh, had been talking about how he wanted to, he wants to make sure that what he is teaching, it gets passed on to the next generation or to, to, you know, to pass his own life. And I think that's an important motivator for many instructors. And for me, I'm, I'm approaching it a little differently in that I'm no longer, I'm no longer going to be, it's not going to be a numbers game, mostly because it can't, because it's going to be a much smaller dojo. Um, but I'm hoping that in making it smaller and then having students who are more in tune with what I, what it is that I'm doing and what I'm teaching that I just want to like, it's not even about the martial arts. It's like, can I make a difference in these people's lives? Because martial arts or otherwise, like if some, you know, somebody comes to my mat, my mats once, I want them to come away from that having had a positive experience that influence in some way in their futures and like and if I can do that every time a student comes on my mat and it leaves then like that that's to me that is what my legacy is going to be thank you so much for that thanks for watching everybody thanks senseis we'll see y'all next week regular bat time regular bat channel